Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. I'm here with our head of semiconductor research and really the head of our new tech team overall, Craig Berger, to talk about a breakdown in the semiconductor stocks and to hit on some stocks specifically that Craig does and does not like. Uh, what's interesting here, Craig, is that we basically we have the socks down about 7% since you started here, which is the first week of July. Uh, it's in line with kind of the breakdown we've seen in growth metrics overall. The Russell 2000 is down about 8%. Uh, but more importantly, the SOX has broken what we call our intermediate term trend line. So for those of you that are watching, the way that we work or the way that we make the sausage here at HedgeEye is I give the top-down view and then the sector expert brings the industry and the bottom-up view. So what do you make of that breakdown? Is it something that you, you should be concerned with? Keith, it, it is somewhat concerning. I mean, what you're seeing in the, in the semiconductor space is a lot of good news on the macro and, and global stability is causing chip firms as customers and their customers to build inventory stocks a little bit higher. There's not a lot of excess inventory out there, but it does drive unsustainable good news into the chip firms' revenues, gross margins, and profits. And what you're seeing is there's a lot of frothiness out there, there's a lot of strength, and it's probably as good as it gets with some pain uh, to pay the piper in early 2015. And, and, and the pain, like definitively, is particularly with your sector, now that I'm used to working with lower beta sector heads. Uh, you know, the pain happens pretty quick. So my model would say here, uh, first of all, if you're, if you're keeping score of the SOX, the trend line is 618. That's the SOX. And the trend line for the SMH, which is the ETF, uh, is 49.29. So again, corrections on the order of 7%. Uh, but it's, I still have like 9% downside to what I call long-term support. Is that, is that doable in this type of a correction? I, I think it's, it's more than doable. And historically, you know, if this is just a correction, that's one thing. If it's a small or muted down cycle for semiconductors, because it is a cyclical, that's another thing. Um, okay. Historically, in a down cycle, uh, the, the lowest down cycle sell-off has been 22%, wow. and the shortest duration sell-off from peak to trough has been 24 weeks. Wow. And so, and, and so in weeks, we're not even three to four weeks into this, and in terms of order of magnitude, we're nowhere near what a typical correction would look like. There's more to go. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. Now, just getting into the stocks, you know, you know that this is kind of how we go back and forth. But so Craig gives me uh, his best ideas long and short side, and then I grind it through the macro uh, quantitative signaling process, and then I come up with what looks like his best short idea and his best long. So what I came up with, Craig, here, your best looking short idea to me for now, you got a lot of good short ideas. Uh, so no offense, but uh, the be best looking one is Nvidia. Uh, big breakdown from a trend perspective on accelerating volume. What's going on there? Um, NVIDIA does have a lot of exposure to PC. PC's been doing better of late. Um, my own personal view is that unit growth is not sustainable in the PC market. You still have iPads and tablets taking share from x86 Intel-based PCs. Um, so recently it's been good news. I suspect that good news will start to shift back towards bad news at some point. Also, NVIDIA, um, you know, they get a lot of their earnings from an Intel royalty payment that's set to expire in about 18 months. Mm. And so if you take that out, the earnings power isn't great. Now, on the plus side, the bulls will argue that NVIDIA is doing some of the more innovative and interesting things in the compute space around uh, server processing, parallel compute. Um, so they have some interesting things working on, but those are longer term yep. and will take time to play out. And that's typically what you see when a sector breaks down. The more interesting longer term stories actually break down faster because a lot of astute investors are actually in it for those reasons. But the intermediate term has to occur in between now and then. Uh, on the long side, one of the few stocks that looks good is Broadcom. What's going on there? Broadcom has been an underloved and underowned chip stock. Um, They've been trying to make a go out, uh, in, their, in the cellular market, mm -hmm. and they recently in June said that after 10 years of trying to grow meaningfully in that market and compete with Qualcomm, that they're punting on that business. And so a lot of the spending that they'd uh, been incurring without revenues is flowing back into the P&L. The estimates went up by about 60 cents, and investors are sort of reassessing the story, coming back into the name. Earnings power is a lot better. They do have great products. Um, the wireless business has been a little challenged, but they're a leader in their core markets, which include things like Wi-Fi, set-top box processors, cable modem processors, 
um, and data center and enterprise networking switch processors. Mm -hmm. What I like about that is that you know if I look at the top holder list of Broadcom, it's really not populated by you know, some, some kind of hedge fund hotel or anything. It's just not a widely held or most popular type of a stock. So that's, that's interesting. Now something that has been popular on the short side in the hedge fund community has been Intel. And that stock's had a heck of a move on the upside. You used to work there. I'm sure everyone wants to know what you think about that. Um, Intel's had a good run. It's rallying because we've been in a corporate PC refresh, right? Windows XP support has ended. A lot of corporate PC users uh, went out and bought new machines. Now, PC unit growth has inflected positive. It's up something like five or six percent year over year after a couple years of being negative. And so um, investors are like, okay, the good times are back. My, uh, add to that the fact that Intel has announced a $20 billion share repurchase over the next year, and the stock has gone up. With a buyback of that size, the stock will probably continue to act well during this sort of semi-correction or down cycle. Um, but once you get past the near-term sort of corporate PC refresh strength and the buyback, I don't like the stock. I'm still of the opinion that uh, iPads, tablets, and smartphones are taking a larger share of compute and that x86 PCs will begin to shrink again. Um, I kind of feel it's inevitable. Um, and while Intel's done some things well, they haven't innovated outside of their core PC market that well. And so I still think it's, it's good today, but the risk is that it gets less good in the next year. Yeah, this, this is like you made a great call on this stock. For those of you that don't know, on the day that Intel popped, Craig made a call to sell it. That was a good call, but what he's basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying here is that this thing could hold its own. Immediate term trade support for me and my model is 32, just, just north of 3260. So, you know, it could correct to there and hold because they're going to buy back the stock. It's, it's like a 13 or 14 percent repurchase. It's um, huge. It's, it's huge. Yeah. So now the other the other company that's buying a lot of stock back that's not that's really doesn't look like Intel. It's broken from a trend perspective. Is Qualcomm? What's going on? There? So Qualcomm, great company, better fundamental story than Intel. They're innovative. Um, you know, mobile's still growing. But what you've seen in Qualcomm is they've had a dispute with some of their Chinese customers. Mm -hmm. The Chinese government is actually encouraging Qualcomm's Chinese customers to underpay Qualcomm in royalties. And <laughs> so it's a it's kind of a China versus the US trade war deal. Um, Qualcomm has had trade disputes with Chinese customers in the past and positively resolved those and ended up getting paid. But this could drag on a while. Mm -hmm. And so people that are looking for iPhone strength and smartphone strength overall with the Chinese guys uh, ramping volumes, right? Chinese guys are Qualcomm customers on the chip side and the royalty side, the ramping customers. So business is good at Qualcomm. Everybody thought it was going to be good, but this really throws a monkey wrench into the story. It's probably not going to get resolved soon, and some long-term holders are punting until visibility improves into how long this takes, how big it could be, um, and where do we go from here. And this one is you know, very popular for a lot of very obvious reasons. So again, this stock would look like, to me at least, would look like it's under distribution, and you wouldn't di di disagree with that. I wouldn't. Um, now, they're also buying back stock. It's not as big as Intel's $20 billion. It's probably going to be about $7 billion, which is still big. <laughs> But you know, with with sort of the bad news rolling yeah. in, it's probably not going to be enough to well, that, to fully offset the selling pressure. And if they pressure. know what you know or what you think you know that they know, I mean, why wouldn't they wait for lower prices if they don't have some kind of clarification on the Chinese issue? So, you know, there is some kind of watch what they do here. It would seem in the marketplace. We're probably going to get lower prices. I mean, seventy seems to be the next stop on Qualcomm. Yeah, that that looks about right to me. So. Uh, that's an interesting wrap-up. So net, 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 there's not a lot to be excited about in semiconductors, of course, unless you're a short seller, uh, which Craig likes to make short calls, and I do too. So if you have any questions on that, he's at Hedgeye Burger. That's his new Twitter handle, and I'm, of course, at Keith McCullough. Thanks.